Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Friends, we have a money problem. And by we, I don't just mean the Katie family, or Asbury First, or the greater Rochester community, or the state of New York, or the United States of America, or North America, or the Northern Hemisphere, but all of us. If the financial crisis of the last few years has taught us anything, it's that, like it or not, when one of us has a problem, we all do. And friends, we all have a money problem. The problem? There never seems to be enough of it. No matter how much is printed, or promised, or saved, no matter how high the jackpot gets, or the stock market, there never seems to be enough to go around. Sure, there's enough for a few, a select few. For one reason or another, in our world, we always seem to have some who are very, very rich, but many who are very, very poor. Over the last few years, we've been reminded of this in the headlines. We've been reminded of new and creative ways that companies or persons or governments have managed to rob from the poor to give to the rich. And unfortunately, as Christians, we are not immune to these problems. Sure, we'd like to be, but the fact is we struggle ourselves with how to not make money an idol in our lives. We struggle ourselves with what it means to live and give faithfully. Fortunately for us, we have places to which we can turn for guidance. MSNBC and Fox News. Just kidding. <clears throat> no. As with anything, when we have questions, we can turn to those traditional building blocks of our faith. We can seek wisdom from our common tradition, from our sense of reason, from our experience of God. And from each of those sources, we can glean some understanding of how we are called to be good stewards of our wealth how we're called to use wisely that which we have been, for a moment, entrusted. But when those sources are not enough, when as a people of faith we have worked through our common tradition and reason and experience, and we are still left with questions, Fortunately for us, by the grace of God, we have another source to which we can turn. The Holy Scriptures. Our Bible. That other source of authority in order to receive that final, clear, black and white understanding of how we are to treat money. And as we flip through our Bibles this morning, we hear some common themes, especially in these Gospels. We see that we are called to share what we have. Hmm, interesting. We're warned that the love of money is the root of all evil. 
We're reminded that it's as hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven as for a camel to thread the eye of a needle. And then, just when we think we've got it, just when we're ready to give up cable for the year and instead make a pledge to our church, not a bad idea, <laughs> we come across our passage today. Today, friends, we hear a strange little parable. After a week in which we've watched and experienced two mass shootings both here and abroad, both directly or indirectly reflections of our money problem, after a week that has watched Congress continue to bicker about how to take care of our finances, we pause to hear a strange little parable. Now, as we've already discovered, Luke's parables are almost always a little strange, a little unique. He never quite follows the pattern of his synoptic brothers, Matthew and Mark, but over the last couple of chapters, we have a fairly exceptional series. Following the story of the lost sheep, which we discussed last week, a version of which is also found in Matthew, Luke goes off on a little tangent of his own, telling parables that no one else tells, the lost coin and the prodigal son, each having something to do with money each having something to do with money, but coming in response to questions about inclusion. Do you hear he tells parables about money in response to questions about inclusion? Perhaps Luke was reminding the early church and in turn us that what we do with our money says something about who we think is important. Sometimes we think that the way we spend our money is between us and our loved ones. And while we can pretend like that's the case, the hard truth is, whether we like it or not, the way we spend our money affects the people around us. Each dollar that we spend casts a vote for what we think is important in this world. The way we choose to spend our money says something about who we think is important. It's one of the reasons why the United Methodist Church is against gambling. Not only does it disproportionately affect the poor, but it builds hope on the promise of individual gain while feeding a system that by its very nature takes advantage of others. In other words, friends, it's counter to the call of the gospel. The call of the gospel is not about us as individuals, it's about us as a whole. And Luke is trying to remind us of that. After Jesus shares the parable of the prodigal son, one of the most beautiful in all of the Gospels, he shares one of the most confusing. Luke has Jesus turning from the Pharisees to the disciples to share the parable of the unjust steward, which basically goes like this. There's a business owner, wealthy, who discovers that his manager has been squandering his property. And as any owner might do, he decides to let that manager go. But first, he asks for an accounting of his management. Now, the manager naturally gets a little freaked out and decides that he's going to pick up the accounts receivable pile because he's too weak to dig and too ashamed to beg and to call in each of those people one by one and to cut what they owe to their master, his master and to let them go. They only pay a fraction of what they originally owe. Now, this is the part when we think, aha, it's going to get good. 
The owner comes back, and just when we think there's going to be some good old-fashioned yelling and screaming, there's not. Au contraire. Instead, the owner pats that dishonest manager on the back and then says, you've acted shrewdly, or as might be translated, wisely or prudently, not the reaction we're expecting. To confuse matters further, the owner continues explaining that the children of this age are much more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light, children of light being an early church term for Christians, for people who walk in the light. And then the text suggests that Jesus adds, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. So I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. What? <laughs> what is Jesus talking about? Why is he asking us to make friends by means of dishonest wealth? After all, this is supposedly the same guy who calls us to eat with the poor and the lame and the lost, who asks his disciples to sell their possessions and give them to the poor, who asks for radical discipleship in response to this radical message, love your God, your neighbor, and your enemy in the same way. But lest there be confusion, there's an explanatory note. It says, whoever is faithful in little is also faithful in much. And who's ever dishonest in little is also dishonest in much. If then you've not been faithful with dishonest wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another who will give you what is your own. No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You cannot serve God and wealth. Okay. We get that part. Not that it's easy, it's not, but at least it's what we expect to hear. The problem, of course, sort of like last week, is that it completely ignores the parable that came before. Completely! It says the opposite of what that parable seems to be saying. Make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. You cannot serve God and wealth. What? Now, fortunately, we're not the first people to have struggled with this particular passage. Nor, thank God, will we be the last. The truth is, every scholar who has looked at this passage since the founding of our church has come away with basically the same scholarly conclusion. We have no idea what this means. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know what this means. But friends, there's a difference between we don't know and we don't know, but we're trying to find out. And so today, as we do each Sunday, let's try and find out. Now, as we start, we should probably begin by acknowledging that one interpretation of this parable is, in fact, like it or not, possible. It's the one that Bernie Madoff might really love. 
It's one that takes this particular piece of scripture literally, at face value. Perhaps in this one moment, Jesus is calling us to be dishonest with our wealth. It's possible. But given what we know about Jesus, and frankly what we know about Luke, we can't help but wonder if there's another possibility. You see, Luke was writing toward the end of the first century, perhaps as much as 50 years after the death of Jesus, and he had a fairly specific audience in mind, the early church. Maybe the early church to whom Luke was writing was having some issues with money. Yes, it seems unfathomable for a church ever to have issues with money, but it was a long time ago. So maybe Luke had this snippet of a saying of Jesus that he put here with an explanation that tried to make sense of it, that he thought worked with it ironically. In that interpretation, Jesus would be pointing out that it's perfectly possible to be patted on the back for the way we have worked for our own personal gain. That it's possible in this world to be celebrated for our accumulated wealth. He says that the children of this age will be seen as more shrewd or wise or prudent than those who call themselves Christians. But perhaps he's implying that there's more to life than being shrewd with money. Perhaps he's saying to make friends by means of dishonest wealth so that someone will welcome you into the eternal homes. The word used for home here might better be translated as tent. And as anyone who's ever done any camping can tell us, there's nothing eternal about a tent. Do you hear? He's saying that all that glitters is not gold. That these things that we have, these treasures that we build up for ourselves are ultimately fleeting. And while we might be celebrated for what we do for ourselves, life is only fully lived when we do unto others. Life is best shared. Do you hear? We're called to invest in each other. Friends, we're not called to be Democrats or Republicans, though there are faithful people in both parties. No, first and foremost, we're called to be Christians, which means that we treat these things with which we have been entrusted in some very strange ways. Ways that aren't just concerned with a bottom line. Ways that aren't just about how to grow our portfolios. Ways that aren't just about us. The truth is, if we were only concerned with those things, about using our money to make more money, about building up the most we possibly could, we wouldn't share. We wouldn't tithe. But we also wouldn't fully live. As John Wesley puts it, we are called to earn all we can, to save all we can, and to give all we can. It's one of the reasons why, as members of the church, we pledge each year. Sure, it's nice to give without pledging, and that's very helpful. Don't stop. But when we pledge, We make a commitment to one another which says that we are better together. In other words, friends, he tells a parable about money to answer a question about inclusion. Both interpretations of this parable the one that takes it literally at face value, and the one that takes it somewhat ironically, along with many more, are possible. In fact, that's sort of the point of a parable. 
There's no one right way to understand the passage. The whole Bible is like that, friends. There's no one way to understand what we get in the Scripture. In fact, a statement of doctrine will not survive generation to generation. We can always say, we can write it off as only applicable to that particular time or that particular culture, but a story asks us to reinterpret it with each passing generation. Friends, we have a responsibility to figure out what it means for ourselves. It's okay to not know for there to be mystery and confusion in this holy book. There's not one biblical voice, but many voices, and it's our job to interpret them. Part of its beauty is that we don't always know what it means. But friends, there's a difference between I don't know and I don't know but I'm trying to find out. The good news is that we don't have to figure it out alone. So in the end, when we have questions about how to live faithfully and justly in our world, when we have problems with money or inclusion or anything else, we can certainly turn to those building blocks of our faith, to the Scripture and to our reason, and to our tradition, and to our experience of God in the world. But we can also turn to each other. Because frankly, even when we don't have much else, even when our money problems overwhelm us, even when we can't seem to rub two dimes together, By the grace of God, we still have each other. What more do we need? Amen.